The Man Who Knew Too Much by G. K. Chesterton. Read for LibriVox.org by Martin Clifton. Chapter Eight The Vengeance of the Statue. It was on the sunny veranda of a seaside hotel, overlooking a pattern of flower beds and a strip of blue sea, that Horne Fisher and Harold March had their final explanation, which might be called an explosion. Harold March had come to the little table, and sat down at it with a subdued excitement smouldering in his somewhat cloudy and dreamy blue eyes. In the newspapers which he tossed from him onto the table, there was enough to explain some, if not all, of his emotion. Public affairs in every department had reached a crisis. The government, which had stood so long that men were used to it, as they are used to a hereditary despotism, had begun to be accused of blunders, and even of financial abuses. Some said that the experiment of attempting to establish a peasantry in the west of England, on the lines of an early fancy of horned fishers, had resulted in nothing but dangerous quarrels with more industrial neighbours. There had been particular complaints of the ill-treatment of harmless foreigners, chiefly Asiatics, who happened to be employed in the new scientific works constructed on the coast. Indeed, the new power which had arisen in Siberia, backed by Japan and other powerful allies, was inclined to take the matter up in the interests of its exiled subjects, and there had been wild talk about ambassadors and ultimatums. But something much more serious in its personal interest for March himself seemed to fill his meeting with his friend with a mixture of embarrassment and indignation. Perhaps it increased his annoyance that there was a certain unusual liveliness about the usually languid figure of Fisher. The ordinary image of him in March's mind was that of a pallid and bald-browed gentleman, who seemed to be prematurely old as well as prematurely bald. He was remembered as a man who expressed the opinions of a pessimist in the language of a lounger. Even now March could not be certain whether the change was merely a sort of masquerade of sunshine, or that effect of clear colours and clean-cut outlines that is always visible on the parade of a marine resort, relieved against the blue dado of the sea. But Fisher had a flower in his buttonhole, and his friend could have sworn he carried his cane with something almost like the swagger of a fighter. With such clouds gathering over England, the pessimist seemed to be the only man who carried his own sunshine. "'Look here,' said Harold March abruptly. "'You've been no end of a friend to me, and I never was so proud of a friendship before. But there's something I must get off my chest. The more I found out, the less I understood how you could stand it, and I tell you I'm going to stand it no longer.' Horn Fisher gazed across at him gravely and attentively but rather as if he were a long way off. "'You know, I always liked you,' said Fisher quietly, "'but I also respect you, which is not always the same thing. You may possibly guess that I like a good many people I don't respect. Perhaps it is my tragedy, perhaps it is my fault. But you are very different, and I promise you this, that I will never try to keep you as somebody to be liked at the price of your not being respected.' I know you're magnanimous, said March, after a silence, and yet you tolerate and perpetuate everything that is mean. Then, after another silence, he added, Do you remember when we first met, when you were fishing in that brook in the affair of the target? And do you remember you said that, after all, it might do no harm if I could blow the whole tangle of this society to hell with dynamite? Yes, and what of that? asked Fisher. Only that I'm going to blow it to hell with dynamite, said Harold March, and I think it right to give you fair warning. For a long time I didn't believe things were as bad as you said they were, but I never felt as if I could have bottled up what you knew, supposing you really knew it. Well, the long and the short of it is that I've got a conscience, and now, at last, I've also got a chance. I've been put in charge of a big independent paper with a free hand, and we're going to open a cannonade on corruption. That will be Atwood, I suppose, said Fisher reflectively. Timber merchant, knows a lot about China. 
He knows a lot about England, said March doggedly, and now I know it too. We're not going to hush it up any longer. The people of this country have a right to know how they're ruled, or rather ruined. The Chancellor is in the pocket of the money-lenders, and has to do as he is told, otherwise he's bankrupt, and a bad sort of bankruptcy too, with nothing but cards and actresses behind it. The Prime Minister was in the petrol contract business, and deep in it too. The Foreign Minister is a wreck of drink and drugs. When you say that plainly about a man who may send thousands of Englishmen to die for nothing, you're called personal. If a poor engine driver gets drunk and sends thirty or forty people to death, nobody complains of the exposure being personal. The engine driver is not a person. I quite agree with you, said Fisher calmly. You're perfectly right. If you agree with us, why the devil don't you act with us? demanded his friend. If you think it's right, why don't you do what's right? It's awful to think of a man of your abilities simply blocking the road to reform. We have often talked about that, replied Fisher, with the same composure. The Prime Minister is my father's friend, the Foreign Minister married my sister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer is my first cousin. I mentioned the genealogy in some detail just now for a particular reason. The truth is, I have a curious kind of cheerfulness at the moment. It isn't altogether the sun and the sea, sir. I'm enjoying an emotion that is entirely new to me. A happy sensation I never remember having had before. What the devil do you mean? I'm feeling proud of my family, said Horn Fisher. Harold March stared at him with round blue eyes and seemed too much mystified even to ask a question. Fisher leaned back in his chair in his lazy fashion, and smiled as he continued. Look here, my dear fellow, let me ask a question in turn. You imply that I have always known these things about my unfortunate kinsman. So I have. Do you suppose that Atwood hasn't always known them? Do you suppose he hasn't always known you as an honest man who would say these things when he got a chance? Why does Atwood unmuzzle you like a dog at this moment, after all these years? I know why he does. I know a good many things, far too many things. And therefore, as I have the honour to remark, I am proud of my family at last. But why? repeated March, rather feebly. I am proud of the Chancellor because he gambled, and the Foreign Minister because he drank, and the Prime Minister because he took a commission on a contract, said Fisher firmly. I am proud of them because they did these things, and can be denounced for them, and know they can be denounced for them, and are standing firm for all that. I take off my hat to them because they are defying blackmail, and refusing to smash their country to save themselves. I salute them as if they were going to die on the battlefield. After a pause he continued, and it will be a battlefield too, and not a metaphorical one. We have yielded to foreign financiers so long that now it is war or ruin. Even the people, even the country people, are beginning to suspect that they are being ruined. That is the meaning of the regrettable incidents in the newspapers. The meaning of the outrages on Orientals? asked March. The meaning of the outrages on Orientals, replied Fisher, is that the financiers have introduced Chinese labour into this country with the deliberate intention of reducing workmen and peasants to starvation. Our unhappy politicians have made concession after concession, and now they are asking concessions which amount to our ordering a massacre of our own poor. If we do not fight now, we shall never fight again. They will have put England in an economic position of starving in a week. But we are going to fight now. I shouldn't wonder if there were an ultimatum in a week and an invasion in a fortnight. All the past corruption and cowardice is hampering us, of course. The West Country is pretty stormy and doubtful, even in a military sense, and the Irish regiments there that are supposed to support us by the new treaty are pretty well in mutiny, for, of course, this infernal coolie capitalism is being pushed in Ireland, too. But it's to stop now, and if the government message of reassurance gets through to them in time, they may turn up after all by the time the enemy lands. 
for my poor old gang is going to stand to its guns at last. Of course, it's only natural that when they have been whitewashed for half a century as paragons, their sins should come back on them at the very moment when they are behaving like men for the first time in their lives. Well, I tell you, March, I know them inside out, and I know they are behaving like heroes. Every man of them ought to have a statue, and on the pedestal words like those of the noblest ruffian of the revolution. Que mon nom soit flétri, que la France soit libre. Good God, cried March, shall we never get to the bottom of your mines and countermines? After a silence, Fisher answered in a lower voice, looking his friend in the eyes. Did you think there was nothing but evil at the bottom of them? he asked gently. Did you think I had found nothing but filth in the deep seas into which fate has thrown me? Believe me, you never know the best about men till you know the worst about them. It does not dispose of their strange human souls to know that they were exhibited to the world as impossibly impeccable waxworks, who never looked after a woman or knew the meaning of a bribe. Even in a palace life can be lived well, and even in Parliament life can be lived with occasional efforts to live it well. I tell you, it is as true of these rich fools and rascals as it is true of every poor footpad and pickpocket, that only God knows how good they have tried to be. God alone knows what the conscience can survive, or how a man who has lost his honour will still try to save his soul. There was another silence and March sat staring at the table and Fisher at the sea. Then Fisher suddenly sprang to his feet and caught up his hat and stick with all his new alertness and even pugnacity. Look here, old fellow, he cried, let us make a bargain. Before you open up your campaign for Atwood, come down and stay with us for one week to hear what we're really doing. I mean with the faithful few, formerly known as the old gang, occasionally to be described as the low lot. There are really only five of us that are quite fixed and organising the national defence. And we're living like a garrison in a sort of broken down hotel in Kent. Come and see what we're really doing and what there is to be done and do us justice. And after that, with unalterable love and affection for you, publish and be damned. Thus it came about that in the last week before the war, when events moved most rapidly, Harold March found himself one of a sort of small house party of the people he was proposing to denounce. They were living simply enough, for people with their tastes, in an old brown brick inn faced with ivy and surrounded by rather dismal gardens. At the back of the building the garden ran up very steeply to a road along the ridge above, and a zigzag path scaled the slopes in sharp angles turning to and fro amid evergreens so sombre that they might rather be called ever black. Here and there up the slope were statues having all the cold monstrosity of such minor ornaments of the eighteenth century. And a whole row of them ran as on a terrace along the last bank at the bottom, opposite the back door. This detail fixed itself first in March's mind, merely because it figured in the first conversation he had with one of the cabinet ministers. The cabinet ministers were rather older than he had expected to find them. The prime minister no longer looked like a boy, though he still looked a little like a baby. But it was one of those old and venerable babies, and the baby had soft grey hair. Everything about him was soft, to his speech and his way of walking. But over and above that his chief function seemed to be sleep. People left alone with him got so used to his eyes being closed that they were almost startled when they realised in the stillness that the eyes were wide open and even watching. One thing at least would always make the old gentleman open his eyes. The one thing he really cared for in this world was his hobby of armoured weapons, especially eastern weapons, and he would talk for hours about Damascus blades and Arab swordsmanship. Lord James Herries, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, was a short, dark, sturdy man, with a very sallow face and a very sullen manner, which contrasted with the gorgeous flower in his buttonhole, and his festive trick of being always slightly overdressed. It was something of a euphemism to call him a well-known man about town. There was perhaps more mystery in the question of how a man who lived for pleasure seemed to get so little pleasure out of it. 
Sir David Archer, the Foreign Secretary, was the only one of them who was a self-made man, and the only one of them who looked like an aristocrat. He was tall and thin and very handsome, with a grizzled beard. His grey hair was very curly, and even rose in front into rebellious ringlets that seemed to the fanciful to tremble like the antennae of some giant insect, or to stir sympathetically with the restless tufted eyebrows over his rather haggard eyes. For the Foreign Secretary made no secret of his somewhat nervous condition, whatever might be the cause of it. Do you know that mood when one could scream because a mat is crooked, he said to March, as they walked up and down in the back garden below the line of dingy statues? Women get into it when they've worked too hard, and I've been working pretty hard lately, of course. It drives me mad when Harry's will wear his hat a little crooked, habit of looking like a gay dog. Sometime I swear I'll knock it off. That statue of Britannia over there isn't quite straight. It sticks forward a bit, as if the lady were going to topple over. The damn thing is that it doesn't topple over and be done with it. See, it's clamped with an iron prop. Don't be surprised if I get up in the middle of the night to hike it down. They paced the path for a few moments in silence, and then he continued, It's odd those little things seem specially big when there are bigger things to worry about. We'd better go in and do some work. Horn Fisher evidently allowed for all the neurotic possibilities of Archer and the dissipated habits of Herries, and whatever his faith in their present firmness did not unduly tax their time and attention, even in the case of the Prime Minister. He had got the consent of the latter, finally, to the committing of the important documents, with the orders to the Western armies, to the care of a less conspicuous and more solid person, an uncle of his named Horn Hewitt, a rather colourless country squire who had been a good soldier, and was the military adviser of the committee. He was charged with expediting the government pledge, along with the concerted military plans, to the half-mutinous command in the West and the still more urgent task of seeing that it did not fall into the hands of the enemy, who might appear at any moment from the east. Over and above this military official, the only other person present was a police official, a certain Dr. Prince, originally a police surgeon and now a distinguished detective, sent to be a bodyguard to the group. He was a square-faced man with big spectacles and a grimace that expressed the intention of keeping his mouth shut. Nobody else shared their captivity except the hotel proprietor, a crusty Kentish man with a crab-apple face, one or two of his servants, and another servant privately attached to Lord James Herries. He was a young Scotchman named Campbell, who looked much more distinguished than his bilious-looking master having chestnut hair and a long saturnine face, with large but fine features. He was probably the only really efficient person in the house. After about four days of the informal council, March had come to feel a sort of grotesque sublimity about these dubious figures, defiant in the twilight of danger, as if they were hunchbacks and cripples left alone to defend a town. All were working hard, and he himself looked up from writing a page of memoranda in a private room to see Horn Fisher standing in the doorway, accoutred as if for travel. He fancied that Fisher looked a little pale, and after a moment that gentleman shut the door behind him and said quietly, Well, the worst has happened, or nearly the worst. The enemy has landed, cried March, and sprang erect out of his chair. Oh, I knew the enemy would land, said Fisher with composure. Yes, he's landed, but that's not the worst that could happen. The worst is that there's a leak of some sort, even from this fortress of ours. It's been a bit of a shock to me, I can tell you, though I suppose it's illogical. After all, I was full of admiration at finding three honest men in politics. I ought not to be full of astonishment if I find only two. He ruminated a moment, and then said in such a fashion that March could hardly tell if he were changing the subject or no, It's hard at first to believe that a fellow like Herries, who had pickled himself in vice-like vinegar, can have any scruple left. But about that I've noticed a curious thing. Patriotism is not the first virtue. 
patriotism rots into Prussianism when you pretend it is the first virtue. But patriotism is sometimes the last virtue. A man will swindle or seduce who will not sell his country. But who knows? But what is to be done? cried March indignantly. My uncle has the papers safe enough, replied Fisher, and is sending them west tonight. But somebody is trying to get at them from outside, I fear with the assistance of somebody inside. All I can do at present is to try to head off the man outside, and I must get away now and do it. I shall be back in about twenty-four hours. While I'm away, I want you to keep an eye on these people and find out what you can. Au revoir. He vanished down the stairs, and from the window March could see him mount a motorcycle and trail away toward the neighbouring town. On the following morning March was sitting in the window seat of the old inn parlour, which was oak-panelled and ordinarily rather dark, but on that occasion it was full of the white light of a curiously clear morning. The moon had shone brilliantly for the last two or three nights. He was himself somewhat in shadow in the corner of the window seat, and Lord James Herries, coming in hastily from the garden behind, did not see him. Lord James clutched the back of a chair as if to steady himself, and, sitting down abruptly at the table littered with the last meal, poured himself out a tumbler of brandy and drank it. He sat with his back to march, but his yellow face appeared in a round mirror beyond, and the tinge of it was like that of some horrible malady. As March moved, he started violently and faced round. My God, he cried, have you seen what's outside? Outside, repeated the other, glancing over his shoulder at the garden. Oh, go and look for yourself, cried Herries in a sort of fury. Hewitt's murdered and his papers stolen, that's all. He turned his back again and sat down with a thud. His square shoulders were shaking. Harold March darted out of the doorway into the back garden with its steep slope of statues. The first thing he saw was Dr. Prince, the detective, peering through his spectacles at something on the ground. The second was the thing he was peering at. Even after the sensational news he had heard inside, the sight was something of a sensation. The monstrous stone image of Britannia was lying prone and face downward on the garden path and there stuck out at random from underneath it, like the legs of a smashed fly, an arm clad in a white shirt-sleeve, and a leg clad in a khaki trouser, and hair of the unmistakable sandy grey that belonged to Horn Fisher's unfortunate uncle. There were pools of blood, and the limbs were quite stiff in death. "'Couldn't this have been an accident?' said March, finding words at last. "'Look for yourself, I say,' repeated the harsh voice of Herries who had followed him with restless movements out of the door. The papers are gone, I tell you. The fellow tore the coat off the corpse and cut the papers out of the inner pocket. There's the coat over there on the bank, with a great slash in it. But wait a minute, said the detective, Prince, quietly. In that case there seems to be something of a mystery. A murderer might somehow have managed to throw the statue down on him, as he seems to have done. But I bet he couldn't easily have lifted it up again. I've tried, and I'm sure it would want three men at least. Yet we must suppose, on that theory, that the murderer first knocked him down as he walked past, using the statue as a stone club, then lifted it up again, took him out and deprived him of his coat, then put him back again in the posture of death, and neatly replaced the statue. I tell you, it's physically impossible. And how else could he have unclothed a man covered with that stone monument? It's worse than the conjurer's trick when a man shuffles a coat off with his wrists tied. Could he have thrown down the statue after he'd stripped the corpse? asked March. And why? asked Prince sharply. If he'd killed this man and got his papers, he'd be away like the wind. He wouldn't potter about in a garden excavating pedestals of statues. Besides, hello, who's that up there? High on the ridge above them, drawn in dark thin lines against the sky, was a figure looking so long and lean as to be almost spidery. The dark silhouette of the head showed two small tufts like horns, and they could almost have sworn that the horns moved. Archer! shouted Herries with sudden passion, 
and called to him with curses to come down. The figure drew back at the first cry with an agitated movement so abrupt as almost to be called an antic. The next moment the man seemed to reconsider and collect himself, and began to come down the zigzag garden path, but with obvious reluctance, his feet falling in slower and slower rhythm. Through March's mind were throbbing the phrases that this man himself had used, about going mad in the middle of the night and wrecking the stone figure. Just so, he could fancy the maniac who had done such a thing might climb the crest of the hill in that feverish dancing fashion, and look down on the wreck he had made. But the wreck he had made here was not only a wreck of stone. When the man emerged at last onto the garden path, with the full light on his face and figure, he was walking slowly indeed, but easily, and with no appearance of fear. This is a terrible thing, he said. I saw it from above. I was taking a stroll along the ridge. Do you mean that you saw the murder? demanded March, or the accident? I mean, did you see the statue fall? No, said Archer. I mean, I saw the statue fallen. Prince seemed to be paying but little attention. His eye was riveted on an object lying on the path a yard or two from the corpse. It seemed to be a rusty iron bar, bent crooked at one end. One thing I don't understand, he said, is all this blood. The poor fellow's skull isn't smashed, most likely his neck is broken, but blood seems to have spouted as if all his arteries were severed. I was wondering if some other instrument, that iron thing, for instance, but I don't see that even that is sharp enough. I suppose nobody knows what it is. I know what it is, said Archer, in his deep but somewhat shaky voice. I've seen it in my nightmares. It was the iron clamp or prop on the pedestal, stuck on to keep the wretched image upright when it began to wobble, I suppose. Anyhow, it was always stuck in the stonework there, and I suppose it came out when the thing collapsed. Dr. Prince nodded, but he continued to look down at the pools of blood and the bar of iron. I'm certain there's something more underneath all this, he said at last, perhaps something more underneath the statue. I have a huge sort of hunch that there is. We are four men now, and between us we can lift that great tombstone there. They all bent their strength to the business. There was a silence, save for heavy breathing, and then, after an instant of the tottering and staggering of eight legs, the great carven column of rock was rolled away, and the body lying in its shirt and trousers was fully revealed. The spectacles of Dr. Prince seemed almost to enlarge with a restrained radiance like great eyes, for other things were revealed also. One was that the unfortunate Hewitt had a deep gash across the jugular, which the triumphant doctor instantly identified as having been made with a sharp steel edge like a razor. The other was that immediately under the bank lay littered three shining scraps of steel, each nearly a foot long, one pointed and another fitted into a gorgeously jewelled hilt or handle. It was evidently a sort of long oriental knife, long enough to be called a sword, but with a curious wavy edge, and there was a touch or two of blood on the point. I should have expected more blood, hardly on the point, observed Dr. Prince thoughtfully, but this is certainly the instrument. The slash was certainly made with a weapon shaped like this, and probably the slashing of the pocket as well. I suppose the brute threw in the statue by way of giving him a public funeral. March did not answer. He was mesmerized by the strange stones that glittered on the strange sword hilt, and their possible significance was broadening upon him like a dreadful dawn. It was a curious Asiatic weapon. He knew what name was connected in his memory with curious Asiatic weapons. Lord James spoke his secret thought for him, and yet it startled him like an irrelevance. Where is the Prime Minister? Harris had cried suddenly, and somehow like the bark of a dog at some discovery. Dr. Prince turned on him his goggles and his grim face, and it was grimmer than ever. I cannot find him anywhere, he said. I looked for him at once, as soon as I found the papers were gone. That servant of yours, Campbell, made a most efficient search, but there are no traces. 
There was a long silence, at the end of which Herries uttered another cry, but upon an entirely new note. "'Well, you needn't look for him any longer,' he said, "'for here he comes, along with your friend Fisher. "'They look as if they'd been for a little walking tour.' The two figures approaching up the path were, indeed, those of Fisher splashed with the mire of travel and carrying a scratch like that of a bramble across one side of his bald forehead, and of the great grey-haired statesman, who looked like a baby and was interested in eastern swords and swordsmanship. But beyond this bodily recognition, March could make neither head nor tail of their presence or demeanour, which seemed to give a final touch of nonsense to the whole nightmare. The more closely he watched them, as they stood listening to the revelations of the detective, the more puzzled he was by their attitude. Fisher seemed grieved by the death of his uncle, but hardly shocked at it. The other man seemed almost openly thinking about something else, and neither had anything to suggest about a further pursuit of the fugitive spy and murderer, in spite of the prodigious importance of the documents he had stolen. When the detective had gone off to busy himself with that department of the business, to telephone and write his report, when Harris had gone back, probably to the brandy bottle, and the Prime Minister had blandly sauntered away toward a comfortable armchair in another part of the garden, Horn Fisher spoke directly to Harold March. My friend, he said, I want you to come with me at once. There is no one else I can trust so much as that. The journey will take us most of the day and the chief business cannot be done till nightfall, so we can talk things over thoroughly on the way, but I want you to be with me, for I rather think it is my hour. March and Fisher both had motor bicycles, and the first half of their day's journey consisted in coasting eastward amid the unconversational noise of those uncomfortable machines. But when they came out beyond Canterbury, into the flats of eastern Kent, Fisher stopped at a pleasant little public house beside a sleepy stream, and they sat down to eat and to drink and to speak almost for the first time. It was a brilliant afternoon, birds were singing in the wood behind, and the sun shone full on their ale bench and table. But the face of Fisher in the strong sunlight had a gravity never seen on it before. Before we go any farther, he said, there is something you ought to know. You and I have seen some mysterious things and got to the bottom of them before now, and it's only right that you should get to the bottom of this one. But in dealing with the death of my uncle, I must begin at the other end from where our old detective yarns began. I will give you the steps of deduction presently if you want to listen to them. But I did not reach the truth of this by steps of deduction. I will first of all tell you the truth itself, because I knew the truth from the first. The other cases I approached from the outside, but in this case I was inside. I myself was the very core and centre of everything. Something in the speaker's pendant eyelids and grave grey eyes suddenly shook March to his foundations, and he cried distractedly, I don't understand, as men do when they fear that they do understand. There was no sound for a space but the happy chatter of the birds, and then Horn Fisher said calmly, it was I who killed my uncle. If you particularly want more, it was I who stole the state papers from him. Fisher, cried his friend in a strangled voice. Let me tell you the whole thing before we part, continued the other, and let me put it for the sake of clearness, as we used to put our old problems. Now, there are two things that are puzzling people about that problem, aren't there? The first is how the murderer managed to slip off the dead man's coat, when he was already pinned to the ground with that stone incubus. The other, which is much smaller and less puzzling, is the fact of the sword that cut his throat being slightly stained at the point, instead of a good deal more stained at the edge. Well, I can dispose of the first question easily. Horn Hewitt took off his coat before he was killed. I might say he took off his coat to be killed. Do you call that an explanation? exclaimed March. The words seem more meaningless than the facts. Well, let us go on to the other facts, continued Fisher equably. The reason that particular sword is not stained at the edge with Hewitt's blood is that it was not used to kill Hewitt. 
But the doctor, protested March, declared distinctly that the wound was made by that particular sword. I beg your pardon, replied Fisher. He did not declare that it was made by that particular sword. He declared it was made by a sword of that particular pattern. But it was quite a queer and exceptional pattern, argued March. Surely it is far too fantastic a coincidence to imagine. It was a fantastic coincidence, reflected Horne Fisher. It's extraordinary what coincidences do sometimes occur. By the oddest chance in the world, by one chance in a million, it so happened that another sword of exactly the same shape was in the same garden at the same time. It may be partly explained by the fact that I brought them both into the garden myself. Come, my dear fellow, surely you can see now what it means. Put those two things together. There are two duplicate swords, and he took off his coat for himself. It may assist your speculations to recall the fact that I am not exactly an assassin. A duel! exclaimed March, recovering himself. Of course I ought to have thought of that. But who was the spy who stole the papers? My uncle was the spy who stole the papers, replied Fisher, or who tried to steal the papers when I stopped him, in the only way I could. The papers that should have gone west to reassure our friends and give them the plans for repelling the invasion would in a few hours have been in the hands of the invader. What could I do? To have denounced one of our friends at this moment would have been to play into the hands of your friend Atwood and all the party of panic and slavery. Beside, it may be that a man over forty has a subconscious desire to die as he has lived, and that I wanted, in a sense, to carry my secrets to the grave. Perhaps a hobby hardens with age, and my hobby has been silence. Perhaps I feel that I have killed my mother's brother, but I have saved my mother's name. Anyhow, I chose a time when I knew you were all asleep, and he was walking alone in the garden. I saw all the stone statues standing in the moonlight, and I myself was like one of those stone statues walking. In a voice that was not my own, I told him of his treason and demanded the papers. And when he refused, I forced him to take one of the two swords. The swords were among some specimens sent down here for the Prime Minister's inspection. He's a collector, you know. They were the only equal weapons I could find. To cut an ugly tale short, we fought there on the patch in front of the Britannia statue. He was a man of great strength, but I had somewhat the advantage in skill. His sword grazed my forehead almost at the moment when mine sank into the joint in his neck. He fell against the statue like Caesar against Pompey's, hanging on to the iron rail. His sword was already broken. When I saw the blood from that deadly wound, everything else went from me. I dropped my sword and ran as if to lift him up. As I bent toward him, something happened too quick for me to follow. I do not know whether the iron bar was rotted with rust and came away in his hand, or whether he rent it out of the rock with his ape-like strength. But the thing was in his hand, and with his dying energies, he swung it over my head as I knelt there unarmed beside him. I looked up wildly to avoid the blow, and saw above us the great bulk of Britannia, leaning outward like the figurehead of a ship. The next instant I saw it was leaning an inch or two more than usual, and all the skies with their outstanding stars seemed to be leaning with it. For the third second it was as if the skies fell, and in the fourth I was standing in the quiet garden, looking down on that flat ruin of stone and bone which you were looking at today. He had plucked out the last prop that held up the British goddess, and she had fallen and crushed the traitor in her fall. I turned and darted for the coat which I knew to contain the package, ripped it up with my sword, and raced up the garden path to where my motorbike was waiting on the road above. I had every reason for haste, but I fled without looking back at the statue and the body. And I think the thing I fled from was the sight of that appalling allegory. Then I did the rest of what I had to do. All through the night and into the daybreak and the daylight, I went humming through the villages and markets of South England like a travelling bullet, till I came to the headquarters in the west where the trouble was. I was just in time. I was able to placard the place, so to speak, with the news that the government had not betrayed them, and that they would find supports if they would push eastward against the enemy. 
There's no time to tell you all that happened, but I tell you it was the day of my life, a triumph like a torchlight procession, with torchlights that might have been firebrands. The mutinies simmered down, the men of Somerset and the western counties came pouring into the marketplaces, the men who died with Arthur and stood firm with Alfred. The Irish regiments rallied to them, after a scene like a riot, and marched eastward out of the town singing Fenian songs. There was all that is not understood about the dark laughter of that people, in the delight with which, even when marching with the English to the defence of England, they shouted at the tops of their voices, High upon the gallows tree stood the noble-hearted three, with England's cruel cord about them cast. However, the chorus was God save Ireland, and we could all have sung that just then in one sense or another. But there was another side to my mission. I carried the plans of the defence, and to a great extent, luckily, the plans of the invasion also. I won't worry you with strategics, but we knew where the enemy had pushed forward the great battery that covered all his movements, and though our friends from the west could hardly arrive in time to intercept the main movement, they might get within long artillery range of the battery and shell it, if they only knew exactly where it was. They could hardly tell that, unless somebody round about here sent up some sort of signal. But somehow I rather fancy that somebody will. With that he got up from the table, and they remounted their machines, and went eastward into the advancing twilight of evening. The levels of the landscape were repeated in flat strips of floating cloud, and the last colours of day clung to the circle of the horizon. Receding farther and farther behind them was the semicircle of the last hills, and it was quite suddenly that they saw afar off the dim line of the sea. It was not a strip of bright blue as they had seen it from the sunny veranda, but of a sinister and smoky violet, a tint that seemed ominous and dark. Here Horn Fisher dismounted once more. We must walk the rest of the way, he said, and the last bit of all I must walk alone. He bent down and began to unstrap something from his bicycle. It was something that had puzzled his companion all the way, in spite of what held him to more interesting riddles. It appeared to be several lengths of pole strapped together and wrapped up in paper. Fisher took it under his arm and began to pick his way across the turf. The ground was growing more tumbled and irregular as he was walking toward a mass of thickets and small woods. Night grew darker every moment. We must not talk any more, said Fisher. I shall whisper to you when you are to halt. Don't try to follow me then, for it will only spoil the show. One man can barely crawl safely to the spot, and two would certainly be caught. I would follow you anywhere, replied March, but I would halt too, if that is better. I know you would, said his friend in a low voice. Perhaps you're the only man I ever quite trusted in this world. A few paces farther on they came to the end of a great ridge or mound looking monstrous against the dim sky, and Fisher stopped with a gesture. He caught his companion's hand and wrung it with a violent tenderness, and then darted forward into the darkness. March could faintly see his figure crawling along under the shadow of the ridge, then he lost sight of it, and then he saw it again standing on another mound two hundred yards away. Beside him stood a singular erection made apparently of two rods. He bent over it, and there was the flare of a light. All March's schoolboy memories woke in him, and he knew what it was. It was the stand of a rocket. The confused, incongruous memories still possessed him up to the very last moment of a fierce but familiar sound. And an instant after, the rocket left its perch and went up into endless space like a starry arrow aimed at the stars. March thought suddenly of the signs of the last days, and he knew he was looking at the apocalyptic meteor of something like a day of judgment. Far up in the infinite heavens the rocket drooped and sprang into scarlet stars. For a moment the whole landscape out to the sea and back to the crescent of the wooded hills was like a lake of ruby light, of a red strangely rich and glorious, as if the world were steeped in wine rather than blood, or the earth were an earthly paradise over which paused forever the sanguine moment of morning. God save England, cried Fisher, with a tongue like the peal of a trumpet, and now it is for God to save. 
As darkness sank over land and sea, there came another sound. Far away in the passes of the hills behind them, the guns spoke like the baying of great hounds. Something that was not a rocket, that came not hissing but screaming, went over Harold March's head and expanded beyond the mound into light and deafening din, staggering the brain with unbearable brutalities of noise. Another came, and then another, and the world was full of uproar and volcanic vapour and chaotic light. The artillery of the West Country and the Irish had located the great enemy battery and were pounding it to pieces. In the mad excitement of that moment, March peered through the storm, looking again for the long, lean figure that stood beside the stand of the rocket. Then another flash lit up the whole ridge. The figure was not there. Before the fires of the rocket had faded from the sky, long before the first gun had sounded from the distant hills, a splutter of rifle fire had flashed and flickered all around from the hidden trenches of the enemy. Something lay in the shadow at the foot of the ridge, as stiff as the stick of the fallen rocket. And the man who knew too much knew what is worth knowing. End of chapter and end of the man who knew too much.